Hello, everyone. Welcome. Glad you could make it into our Zoom webinar room today. Thank you for um, being here with us. We're going to get started in just a few minutes, but I'm going to explain who I am and actually what we are doing today. So my name is Kate. I am an educator at the National World War II Museum, which you can see behind me. No, I'm not actually there floating above it. Um, although I wish I was at the museum right now. But we are going to talk a little bit about D-Day today. Now this is a student program, so it is geared towards students. So students, kids, I'm talking to you guys, I need your help today. Because a lot of our programs have been, you know, kind of a presentation and then a Q&A at the end, but this is gonna be a little bit different. We're gonna learn about D-Day by planning D-Day ourselves. So I need your help. Now I know that I can't see and hear you. So when I ask a question, I'll pause and I'll say pause just in case you're watching this recorded and you know to pause until you've answered it. But if you're here with us live today, I want you to type the answer or what you think the answer is in the chat function. Give you about 30 seconds or so to get your answer in then we'll move on. And I'll explain this all a little bit more as we get started, because we're gonna jump right into it with some of our first questions. And at the end, I'm gonna show a clip from our D-Day electronic field trip that we aired last year for the 75th anniversary of D-Day. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Again, welcome to those of you who are just joining us for our student program about D-Day. And you'll still see me in the corner, really small, but you're gonna see the museum pop up. Now, this museum may look a little different to you if you've been recently to our museum, because this is a picture from when we first started. And why are we talking about the museum when we first started? Well, it begins with our first question. So, we're the National World War II Museum, but we started off as the National D-Day Museum. And my question for you guys is why? Why do you think, and this is actually the most asked question by any age group that comes to visit our museum or engages with our museum. Why was the National D-Day and then the National World War II Museum, why was it located in New Orleans? Why not, you know, when we think of museums, sometimes we think of Washington, D.C. or other places, but not New Orleans. So why? Why was the World War II and the D-Day Museum in New Orleans? And this is actually a picture a little bit more recent of what our museum looks like today. So hopefully when all of this is over, you can come visit our museum and see what it looks like. But again, get those questions and those answers in. Why in New Orleans? Now, if you're having trouble, I've given you a really big hint on your screen right now. So the why was the D-Day Museum in New Orleans? There's a big hint on the screen. So if you're watching this recorded, pause here, talk about it, talk about what you see on your screen, and then play it, and we'll talk about the answer. For those of you that have been typing in, the answers, I'm seeing some good ones come in, I'm seeing some right answers. And the answer has to do with the boat, that boat on the screen. So in World War II, boats were really important, specifically boats built by Higgins Industries, which happens to be, you guessed it, in New Orleans. And this is actually a really cool photo, a photo of Higgins Industries or a plant in New Orleans in the 40s. So it was an assembly line, right? You learn about assembly lines in school. Well, this is an assembly line of boats being churned out. Actually, 20,000 boats were turned out. And I've highlighted what I think is a really cool sign that we have um, a version of it here at our museum, but the guy who relaxes is helping to axes. You know, if we talk about this sign, it's talking about the fact that even though you may not have been overseas fighting as a soldier, you were doing your part by helping to build these boats. But what boats? 
And this is where it comes into be really paying attention because those students who are watching right now, in just a few minutes, you're gonna play the role of the generals who decided what to do on D-Day. And in order to play that role, you need to know what you're working with, right? And so we have to, and I'm giving you your briefing generals, what you're working with. So this boat, fully packed with troops can fit about 36. You can see they're not super comfortable, but fit 36 troops or about 10 to 12 troops with a Jeep. And this is a game changer of a boat built right here in New Orleans. But what, and here comes your next question, what is so special about this boat? So I want you to look at this picture on the screen. Think about getting off and on a boat. Not only could you get soldiers and sailors, but you could get vehicles off and on this boat. So pause here to talk about what is different that this boat has that many other boats previously didn't have. And again, if you're watching live, make sure you get those answers in the chat right now. Mm, seeing some good ones come in. Yes, exactly. The ramp. This boat that you generals are going to use to plan D-Day had a ramp, and that is a very important feature. So if we were at our museum right now, and unfortunately we can't be, but if you walked into our main building, the Louisiana Memorial Pavilion, you would see one of these boats. Not too many exist anymore, actually. And the technical name, we want to get technical, is the LCVP. It stands for Landing Craft for Vehicles and Personnel, right? You can both get vehicles and troops off and on this boat. But you've probably heard the name Higgins Boat more recently, and that's because the soldiers give the LCVP the nickname Higgins Boat. So if you've played any maybe World War II video games or, or seen a World War II movie, you've probably seen one of these Higgins boats in action. And these boats, generals, are the boats that you're gonna use today. Now this is a one of a two-part series about D-Day. So we're gonna do half of the planning today. And if you join us tomorrow live, we're gonna do half of the planning in the second half and finish it up tomorrow. So, D-Day, the turning point of the war in Europe. Here's a famous picture, and you can see it's taken from the point of view of a Higgins boat, and you'll see this image a few times throughout this presentation. But I keep saying this word D-Day, right? So let's start there, generals. What, and you're gonna notice a lot of maps, maps are really important for us today. What is D-Day? So, if you're watching this recorded, pause here. And if not, in the chat right now, I want you to take a guess, or maybe you know. What does the D in D-Day stand for? Let's take some answers. I see some good guesses already out there. So if you're just joining us, we're figuring out what the D in D-Day stands for. Mm, very cool. Well, I kind of asked you a trick question, and some of you knew that, because as we're planning D-Day, codename Operation Overlord, we don't know some of the details, and so we can't give it a day or a time yet, and so that D in D-Day becomes a placeholder. It really just means day or date. Sometimes you'll see the words H hour, same thing. We don't know the time yet, so the hour, hour is a placeholder. Although you guys all had some really good guesses and I saw some right answers though, so I'm very impressed so far with the generals in your decisions. But I gotta move on because I have to show you where you're located. So this is Europe in 1942. The Nazis have conquered most of the continent and North Africa. As you can see here, everything in that light red. And the Allies are located on the green, where you see the green highlight. Now, you saw three flags pop up. 
And these are the three countries we're gonna focus on today and tomorrow. But I'm not gonna tell you whose flags those are. So in the chat, or even if you're at home right now, tell the person you're sitting next to, maybe it's your dog or your cat. What three flags are we looking at that just popped in the screen? Whose country's flags are those? So if you're watching recorded, pause here to talk about those three flags. Oh, you guys got it. Right, so of course we see the American flag, but we also see the Canadian and the English flag. And these are the three countries we're gonna focus on today. Now there is another allied country on the other side that we're not really gonna focus on today, but again, whose flag is this? Does anybody know? This is a little bit more difficult. So if you know, make sure you put it in the chat or tell the person or animal that you're sitting next to. Woo. We got a lot of people getting it right on the first time. So that's the Soviet Union flag. And these four countries are gonna really make up the allies, but we're gonna focus on the American, Canadian, and English today. So what's gonna happen? The Soviets are gonna come in from the East and we're not really gonna plan that today, but what we're gonna plan is the other invasion, the other side. And so we have to figure out when, where, and how to do this. So I'm gonna zoom in, I'm gonna give you another map. Again, maps are really important and actually really cool when you're studying not just World War II, but um, a lot of history. So how will the Western Allies get their armies from the island of Great Britain onto the European continent? So we're looking at a map of Northwest Europe, and as you can see, everything in red, has been conquered by the Nazis. The Allies, so the generals you guys are playing today, and we've already named these three countries, are located in the green. Now, there are two really big obstacles in the way from getting from the green to the red, because we're located or headquarters on the green. And when we watch our video clip here in a little bit, you'll see a little bit more about that. But what's gonna make it difficult or be in the way from getting from the green to the red? So pause here and talk about that. One is man-made and one is naturally occurring. And again, if you're watching live, type it in the chat or turn to the person or animal next to you and tell them what's gonna make it difficult to get from the green to the red. Oh, yep. All right, you guys are even getting ahead of me a little bit more. So this man-made issue is the Atlantic Wall. Now, if you don't know what the Atlantic Wall is, generals, fine, I'm gonna brief you on it in a second and you'll be an expert. So generals, we have to keep in mind that this Atlantic Wall are these obstacles built by the Nazis to keep the allies out. But the other thing, as you can see, there's some blue. So the English Channel is in between. England is an island. So we have to cross water. We have to cross the English Channel. And when, when you're working with tens of thousands of troops, anytime you have to cross the, any channel or any body of water, it gets a little bit difficult. So crossing the English Channel, breaking through that Atlantic Wall. But generals, I need to brief you on what exactly this Atlantic Wall is. So let's take a closer look so that you know what you're up against. It's not a solid wall like you think of maybe the Great Wall of Ancient China, but in many ways it's, it's much more deadly. So the first thing we're gonna look at are these large gun emplacements aimed out to the sea. And you can see one from World War II. And amazingly, some of these defensive structures were so well built and fortified that they're still standing on the beaches of Europe today. Here is a picture of one of the guns along the Atlantic Wall as it looks today in 2020. And as you can see, it's still really, really well built. So these concrete bunkers basically bomb proof to hold not only artillery, but also 
thousands of German soldiers. So we're up against those up and down the coast. So we're gonna have to plan for those. Another obstacle are these dragon's teeth. Millions of deadly beach obstacles placed along the coast to stop any boats or soldiers from landing on the beaches of Western Europe. And you can see here a little bit more closely what they look like. They're big. They don't look deadly, but they're pretty big and they're very heavy. But that's not it, generals. We have hedgehogs. These are crisscrossed steel grinders meant to rip open the bottom of those Higgins boats that we learned about just a while ago as they approach the beaches. We even have a few in our museum as you can see here, just how deadly they look. Germans and Nazis also sometimes strung rolls of razor-sharp barbed wire across them to make it difficult for soldiers who were in the water. So all of these obstacles, combined with millions of landmines and thousands of miles of barbed wire, turn the beaches into pretty, pretty deadly places for any soldiers that try to make it ashore. But there's one more obstacle, General, that we need to talk about. You need to help me figure out how exactly this works. So these are called log ramps, also meant to flip or rip open the bottom of those landing craft or those Higgins boats. Often these ramps or similar poles would be tipped with explosive landmines to blow up any boats or soldiers that touch them. And in this picture, we see German General Erwin Rommel, basically the main man in charge of overseeing the Atlantic Wall in France and Belgium. He's expecting a long line of log ramps right now. But here's a question for you. So generals, if these log ramps are meant to flip over or rip open the bottom of a boat, yet I don't see any water here and we see two men walking, what are these log ramps dependent on or what do they need in order to work? So pause here, talk about it, put it in the chat. What is missing from this photograph or what is this dependent on to work or to be deadly at least? Exactly. The tide. So when the tide came in, you can see that these kind of look just like pieces of floating wood, maybe not that deadly to someone who's, you know, piloting a boat very quickly. But think of it like an iceberg that it's, a lot of it is underwater and the deadly part is under there. And you can only see that when it's low tide. And I actually remember these log ramps because one of our decisions that we have to make tomorrow and I hope you'll join us again tomorrow, is going to be dependent also on the tide. So generals, overall, this is what the beaches we are trying to invade looked like or average. We can see some examples, and I'm gonna highlight them for you, of the log ramps, of the hedgehogs, and the dragon's teeth. This photograph was actually taken by a reconnaissance airplane, and so you can see um, some laborers who are actually building the wall who are running away from the plane when this photo was taken. So how are the Allies going to break through these defenses? Well, these guys are going to figure it out. So if this is who you're playing today. You are playing the Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Forces made up of American, um, British, and Canadian. And the man in the middle, he may look familiar to you. Do you know who he is? You can put it in the chat or pause if you do. He is Dwight Eisenhower, the Supreme Allied Commander. And some of you may know that he later goes on to be president. So today, this is the group that you are playing. As a team, these men are making decisions about D-Day. Now, if you have more than one person you're watching this with and you want to, you can go ahead and assign one person to be Eisenhower. Because just like in the real group, if the group can't make a decision or they're tied, 
Eisenhower gets to make the ultimate call. So we're all generals, but somebody has to be Eisenhower who gets to make the final call. And so we now have come to our first decision. So we're gonna do our first decision today, and you guys have answered a lot of questions already, but now the big one comes. And then the last two, we're going to save for tomorrow. So again, don't forget to join us tomorrow. So in each scenario, I'm going to outline the situation. I'm gonna give you the pros and cons to each option that I'm gonna give you. And then I'm gonna give you about 40 seconds to discuss either on the chat or with the people or maybe your dog around you what option you're going to choose and then we'll learn how our option matches up with the real one so without further ado where to invade this map probably looks pretty familiar to you so again the nazis are on the continent the allies are in great britain the atlantic wall and the English Channel are between them. Think of it almost like a deadly game of Red Rover before. We have to figure out where is the best spot to break through this Atlantic wall. So I'm going to give you four choices. I'm gonna give you the advantages and disadvantage of each choice. They'll pop up on the screen again, and then I'm gonna give you time to discuss which one you would choose and why would you choose it. So, generals, option number one, landing in Holland. So some advantages. You can see the word Berlin popped up. It's all supposed to be one word there, but my computer's not playing nice right now. It's close to the capital of Berlin. And that is the Allies' ultimate goal, to get to Berlin, find Hitler, and end this war sooner rather than later. However, disadvantages. The Nazis are well aware of how close this landing would be to Berlin. And so not only is it very heavily defended up here, but the beaches aren't very well suited for landing. So option number one, close to Berlin, our objective. Disadvantage, beaches aren't well suited for landing, very heavily defended. All right, generals. Option number two a little bit further down. So advantages of option number two. You can see our arrow got a lot shorter here. This is actually the narrowest part of the channel, only 20 miles from England to France. Really, really short if you think about it in terms of how long crossing is. And so the shorter the distance, the easier it is to cross. Disadvantage of option number two. The Nazis know this is the shortest route from England to France, and so it's a fairly obvious spot to cross. It's also very heavily defended. Generals, option number three, a little bit further down. So advantages. You can see we've moved further away from Berlin, so it's not as defended as one and two, option one and two. It has fairly good beaches for landing. But disadvantages, with each choice, we move further west away from Berlin, and the goal is to go east towards Berlin. So this has our soldiers more time on land and probably prolonging the war and taking longer to get to Berlin. Last option, generals. Option number four, Western France. So advantages of choosing option number four to invade. Lightest defenses of them all. The Atlantic Wall exists down here, but it's fairly light compared to one, two, and three. Disadvantages. As you can see, our arrow got really long here. So it's a long time in the water and it's a long time on land. It's the furthest from Berlin. So generals, these are the options that the real generals that you saw earlier were looking at and choosing from. Are you going to choose to invade at option one, two, three, or four? So pause here, discuss, 
And not, don't just say one, two, three, or four. I want you to explain why you're choosing option one or why you're choosing option two. And then we'll talk about the answer. Seeing some good chats. And again, you don't have to put it in the chat. You can also just turn to whomever you are with or even not. Sometimes I talk to myself when I'm making decisions too, so that works. All right. Well, so you'll notice, and some of you knew right away, when I was giving you your options, I did not tell you that option number three was called Normandy, because that may have given it away if you knew Normandy was the site of the invasion. But although all the answers were really good, the generals are going to choose option number three the beaches of Normandy for our D-Day invasion, codename Operation Overlord. So generals, you have made your first decision. You have decided to invade the beaches of Normandy. And tomorrow we're going to do our second and third decisions. But before we do that, I want to quickly talk about a favorite part of D-Day from not only me, but also our museum. We actually had an adult presentation about this group earlier, but in order to trick the Nazis into thinking we were going to option two, the obvious spot, we created fake tanks, big planes, big radio broadcasts um, called the First U.S. Army Group, also known as Ghost Army. And if I were to ask you guys, how do you know this tank is fake? Pretty obvious, right? being held up by, by four men. We can see here some more pictures um, of fake planes, fake trucks made out of blow-up materials and canvas and wood. None of these things are real, but they succeeded in actually tricking the Germans and thinking that they were real. We were going to option number two. And the last thing before we move to our clip from our D-Day electronic field trip, meet Rupert. He's a fake paratrooper from our galleries, actually. So if you come to our museum, you can meet Rupert in person. He was dropped near the Pas de Calais, along with a lot of other Ruperts, to trick the Germans into thinking we were crossing there instead of Normandy. So again, generals, this is part one. We've decided we're using Higgins boats, that we are going to invade at option number three. And now I'm going to move to a clip from our D-Day electronic field trip to talk a little bit more about D-Day, but also to show you some of the things that we've been talking about. Beginning our journey today at the National World War II Museum beside one of our most important artifacts. With me is museum educator Chrissy Gregg. Michael, thank you so much for joining me here today at the museum. We are standing next to this iconic Higgins boat, also known as an LCVP, Landing Craft for Vehicle Personnel. Uh, 13,000 of these boats were built right here in New Orleans during World War II. It has kind of a unique design. If you notice, this front here is actually a ramp. Why would a boat need a ramp? Maybe to assist unloading a Jeep or a truck? Yeah, exactly. The V in uh, LCVP is vehicle, and actually the P is personnel. So it wasn't just uh, vehicles, but also people. Uh, this boat is actually based off of boats that were used uh, here in the Louisiana bayous to get through the shallow swamp water. So actually, this boat could go all the way to a beach 
without getting stuck. You lower down the ramp and you could just run right off or take the equipment right off of it. Weren't thousands of these used in the D-Day operation? Yeah, thousands of these were used in D-Day. Um, and they were just one small piece of the huge operation and all of the boats and ships that would cross the channel on June 6th 1944. Uh, D-Day is important for a lot of reasons. One of them being that it is the largest amphibious invasion in all of human history. So this Higgins boat is important, but it's one small piece of this humongous puzzle. That's a big job. Yeah, seriously, it is a big job and it required a lot of planning and a lot of uh, strategy. It required 12 allied nations all working together really years, but especially a few intense months of planning, a really awesome allied deception campaign. Um, it required 156,000 troops, 6,400 ships and boats, 11,000 airplanes, all in one day. Wow. Yeah, it's crazy, right? <laughs> yes. So uh, today you have a big job. Uh, you are going to be learning all about D-Day. And uh, you're not just gonna be doing that here in New Orleans. I'm actually sending you on a bit of a trip. <laughs> so awesome. yeah, I know, right? <laughs> uh, so actually you're gonna be going off to England oh, wow. first and you're going to be meeting some other students and you guys will be learning all about the planning and strategy behind D-Day because a lot of it happened there. Then you're going to cross the channel, just like they did so many years ago, and land in France. And you're going to meet another French student, and you'll be exploring all of the sites of Normandy to really understand what's important about D-Day and why we remember it 75 years later. So uh, I guess pack your bags. Uh, bon voyage. Okay. <laughs> Today I've arrived in southern England, traveling over 4,500 miles to understand how the Allies put off such a massive invasion. I'll be joined by Wiley from Canada and Lucy from the UK. Our countries were key allies and our teamwork and strategic planning led to a successful operation. Hi Michael, nice to meet you. I'm Lucy, I live in Tassie. So nice to meet you Lucy. How was your flight? Uh, it was alright, but I'm glad to be back on the ground here with y'all in England. In fact, I met Wiley, our student reporter from Canada, on the plane. She was telling me all about Canada's involvement in World War II, and she should be here. Hi everyone, I'm Wiley and I'm from Ontario. I was telling Michael a little bit about the war last night. So basically, in an official capacity, the war began in 1939 for the UK and Canada. The UK declared war against Hitler on September 3rd, and the Canadian Parliament did the same on September 10th. This was actually the only time Canada has ever declared a state of war. This occurred two years before the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, which marked the US's entrance into World War II. Flash forward 1944. Most of the plan for D-Day took place in London over the course of the years. However, we're not in London. Actually, the place we're in could have been more different to the bustling city. Believe it or not, this quaint and sleepy village of Suffolk was critical to the finalising plans of Operation Overlord. Really? That's interesting. As the Allies were nearing the intended invasion date, the primary commanders desired to be closer to the ports in southern England where thousands of Allied soldiers, airmen and sailors, along with the necessary supplies and equipment, would launch. The Manor House, which is just shown behind us, held some of the key meetings in the 11th hour with World War II's famous military leadership. Do you guys want to go inside and take a look? Sure. sure. This beautiful house and the surrounding grounds were the headquarters of Operation Neptune, the naval component of Overlord under Admiral Sir Bertram Ramsey. It was from this house that General Dwight Eisenhower, the Supreme Allied Commander, would give the order to begin the liberation of Northwest Europe. Right now, I'm standing in the home's drawing room, which during the war was tended to a map room for senior commanders. Behind me is the original map that helped plan D-Day, and with me is the curator, Richard Callahan. Hello, Richard. Hi, oh, pleased to meet you. Welcome to the map room here at Southwark House. So, Richard, what exactly was this map used for? Well, this is actually the show and tell of Operation Neptune, the naval part of the Overlord landings. Can you describe the scene around here leading up to the D-Day invasion? It's probably best described as studied chaos. There were 6,000 people in the high command, but very few of them actually had access to this house. The majority were camped just outside in the woods. But within the house itself, there were probably about 50 people all running around doing their separate jobs. 
The house itself was the most secret room in southern England, if not in the Western world. This was where the important decision as to when and where we go in the Normandy landings was taken. What important decisions were made here in the house? The biggest two decisions were actually completely at odds with each other. The first decision was do we go or do we stay? The hero of D-Day was a man called James Stagg. He was a weatherman and every day he would predict the weather and that would be tested against what the weather was like two days later. And for the whole of May, Stagg's predictions were perfect. He's coming up to the biggest decision he has to make. D-Day is set for the 5th of June. On the 4th, he tells Eisenhower on a beautiful summer day that he'll have to postpone. There's a storm coming. The next day, that storm arrives. Eisenhower listens to experts. He's taken the decision. He will postpone the landings by 24 hours. Stagg has better news. He tells the Supreme Commander there is an interval with the weather. It should hit the middle of the channel on the 6th of June. The weather won't be great, but it'll be better than it has been. If we go on the 6th of June, it should give us just long enough to get 160,000 troops by air and by sea to land in Normandy. That night, Eisenhower goes back to his caravan in the woods about a mile behind this house. He has a restless night, but he comes back into the house just after four o'clock in the morning. Stagg has better news. He's much more certain the weather will be better. Montgomery still wants to go. Ramsey's persuaded. Lee Mallory is persuaded. After a short discussion at 19 minutes past four on the morning of the 5th of June, 1944, Eisenhower says three words. Okay, let's go. The planned region of invasion was Normandy, France. The region was divided into five landing zones, along with paratroopers and glider troops landing on the eastern and western flanks of the beaches. The sections of beach in the region were given code names. The American 4th Division would land on Utah Beach. The U.S. 29th and 1st Divisions would land on Omaha Beach. The British 50th would land on Gold Beach, and the 3rd would land on Sword Beach. The Canadian 3rd Division would attack Juneau Beach. Before the sea invasion, thousands of paratroopers from the American 82nd and 101st Airborne, along with the British 6th Airborne, with the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion, would land to capture roads and bridges to prevent German counterattack. The decision was set here in Southwark, but were we ready? Ranger training uh, in England uh, was, uh, normally ranger training would last longer, but for us in a specialized situation, the 30 of us went through ranger training. It's strict infantry division, and also uh, uh, you learn to jump from um, uh, C-47s, which uh, were troop carriers, and uh, you went to intensive training. Uh, and as well as the opportunity to observe actual infantry combat so that as a forward observer you had more of an appreciation of what it was like to be uh, an infantryman per se, so to speak. And uh, it was very beneficial and it really uh, was training that came in handy for me personally during the next uh, year's time. And three WAFs and three ATS. And we did all the initial typing and working on the operation orders for Overlord. And they were being changed all the time because these were the orders for the Navy, the Army, and the Air Force. And uh, naturally, all the services, they were always having to change things. So that was, that was really hard work. And up to the, uh, the months, a few months, before D-Day, we did extraordinary hours because they were running out of time. Um, we worked from, say, 6 a.m. to 12 noon, and then we were on duty again at 6 p.m. till midnight, and then on duty at 6 a.m. again. And so that went on. I don't know how long, how, how long we did that for, but it was, um, it was just non-stop.
Well, thank you everyone, or should I say it general. So that clip was from our D-Day electronic field trip. And we only decided where to go today. We haven't decided when, we haven't decided what tide, we haven't even really decided on an exact date. So please join us tomorrow at the same time, 11 central in this webinar room, because we have a whole second half of this presentation with more oral histories, like you heard from those two. Um, and I want to thank you for participating in our interactive D-Day field trip. You guys were awesome. I enjoyed the chat. And again, don't forget to join us here tomorrow to finish this out. We'll take Q&A at the end of tomorrow, but I don't want to ruin any of it yet. So again, have a great rest of your day, and we will see you here tomorrow to finish out our D-Day virtual field trip. See you guys. <laughs>